Okay, so let's start then. Um, it's my mm -hmm. great pleasure to uh, introduce Jordan Francois. He's joining us from the University of Masaryk in Brno, Czechoslovakia. Um, I'm very grateful to him for agreeing to this unusual way of giving a colloquium. Um, I met Jordan during the summer in Graz and was super impressed by what he's doing. Uh, he's uh, got his PhDs in mathematical physics, uh, theoretical physics from uh, the University of A. Marseille in France. And he's currently a postdoc at Masaryk University. And he's recently co-authored a book, um, Cambridge University Press book on gauge symmetries, symmetry breaking. Um, and I'm really looking forward to his talk. So Jordan, take it away. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you for the very kind introduction and generous introduction. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for receiving. Thank you for the kind invitation, by the way, uh, Philip. So indeed, today I want to talk uh, a bit about the physics of gauge field theory. For those who don't know it, uh, I hope you will take, go away with some appreciation for what it is all about and give you also a sense of my take, at least, on, on what is the uh, ontology associated to that. So, of course, it is a, a word that I will define uh, actually just now. So, let me, I hope everybody can see my little uh, pointer there. I will probably use it a couple of times. So, to do physics, um, if we're stepping back very far, right, to introduce the, the, this topic. So, to do physics is to acquire knowledge uh, about the constitution of nature, right? I hope we can all agree on that. So knowledge is uh, the purview of epistemology, epistemic mean knowledge, um, and uh, the constitution of nature has to do with the ontology. Ontos in Greek means uh, being, right? What, what is, is the, the, the issue of ontology in, in philosophy. So getting knowledge uh, about the constitution of nature implies some degree of dialectics between epistemology, so the science of how we get to acquire knowledge and what is knowledge, what is good knowledge, and the ontology about the constitution of what is in the world. So the question is, for example, um, how does the world constitution constrains our epistemic access to it? Right. Uh, that would be, for example, an example of dialectic between the two, between the knowledge we can acquire about the world and how the constitution of the world constrains that knowledge acquisition. Um, so, other question indeed, do constraints or limits uh, of our epistemic access are reflected or explain features of our theories? And I think, if I'm not wrong, so Philip can uh, correct me on this, but this is aligned with the spirit of our construction programs. Uh, it, my understanding is that such program aims to, to from first principle, uh, rebuild known theories um, to better understand them. And so I would say that basically this perfectly in line with these, these dialectics uh, that I'm now talking about. And I would, last, would like to stress that symmetries, which are key features of 20th century physics, is precisely an example of that dialectic, right? So my proposition, a proposition, is the following, is that symmetry principle that need to be understood as different from symmetry arguments. So symmetry principles are principle of democratic epistemic access to the world, right? That will be my central contention in regarding symmetries in physics. So the constitution of the world, ontology, grounds such epistemic democracy and therefore explains the heuristic power of symmetry principles. Right? 20th century physics has been um, led basically uh, in, by and large by uh, the successful application of symmetry principles. Um, the relativity principles are explicitly stated as such, right? For example, the um, Galilean relativity says that the laws of mechanics are the same for all observers in inertial motions, right? Uh, this is grounded, this, the, the, the efficacy of that principle, the, the, the truth, in a sense, of that principle is grounded in the properties, the physical properties of Newtonian space-time. Right. So, so the constitution of, of the, the, the ontology of Newton and space-time um, grounds the epistemic uh, uh, power, I would say, of the Galilean relativity principle. The same is true for special relativity. 
we'd say that the laws of physics are the same for all observer in initial motions, because again, that principle we discover is grounded in the ontological properties of Minkowski spacetime. Right? Um, those are global symmetries, right? Galilean relativity technically is implemented by something called the, the, the Galileo uh, group of transformation of Newtonian space-time or the Bachmann group. Uh, special relativity, it is well known, um, is implemented by the Lorentz group, the group of symmetry or isometry of Minkowski space. But those are global symmetries. It turns out that uh, the framework of gauge field theory relies on principle of local symmetries that are called gauge symmetries. Uh, and I will, of course, define all those things uh, in, in, due, in due time. Um, general relativity and the standard model of particle physics are gauge field theories, both of them. So our best theories, uh, the pillar of today's fundamental physics, uh, are all gauge field theories. And so our question would be, are local symmetries susceptible of the same epistemic ontological interpretation? And if so, how? And so this is how, what I'm proposing you to uh, look at today. So general relativity, let's let's go back a bit on general relativity to, to, to see uh, how this dialectic between epistemic principle and ontological nature of space-time plays out in the case of general relativity, because it is historically the first and the, the most well-known, I would say. So the first step is to motivate, okay, Einstein motivates a, a general covariance principle that says that the laws of physics are the same for all observers, right? Again, notice it is stated explicitly as a, again, as a principle of democratic epistemic access to the world, to, to the laws of physics, um, right? Um, so technically, this is realized via the use of tensorial calculus and Riemannian geometry on the manifold. M, right? So I hope most of you perhaps are, are, are familiar, at least from, uh, I don't know, some course in, in general relativity, um, with, with this notion, right, of, of a manifold that should describe uh, um, geometry and, and tensile calculus and German geometry. Um, the understanding of the general covariance principle, what does it mean in that context? It means that physics sees only the intrinsic geometry of M, right? So it is, therefore, is coordinate independence, right? Physics doesn't care what coordinate system you use to look at the geometry of M, it cares only that you see intrinsic geometric object on M, tensor fields and, and the like. So M is therefore interpreted as the objective space-time, right? Whose geometry again is independent of the of the coordinate system used. Um, so the properties of space-time, the manifold, uh, ontologic, grounds the gauge the general covariance principle and explain its heuristic power. Right? We, we understand, once we have developed the theory, we understand why it should be so that uh, we have a general covariance principle. Well, the answer is because space-time is a, is a pseudo riemannian manifold, right? And so uh, doing gravitational physics is uh, caring about the intrinsic geometry of, of, of space-time and therefore um, not being interested at all by which corner system you, you might use to describe the, such a geometry. Okay, and usually this is where the story ends for most of us, but actually there is more to it, uh, because there is a new ontological insight uh, coming. Uh, it is based on the observation that the general covariance principle, uh, which is coordinate in very covariance, uh, in a sense, uh, is locally indistinguishable from diffeomorphism invariance. So diffeomorphisms have smooth transformation of, of the manifold, right? Active transformation of the manifold. Most of us, those who have followed courses in GRs, I've heard or at least of the flows of M. But usually we don't make much of it, which is okay. We know those are active transformation of the manifold, while coordinate transformation are called passive uh, diffeomorphism sometimes. But what is very important, that is a key consequence uh, of, uh, or key insight, I would say, of, of general relativity, um, is due to what is called the whole argument. Right? I cannot enter into the detail of the whole argument, but the point of, of the whole idea is to say that physics do not see the points of M, right? In a sense, let me say it like that way. If you have your, your manifold M and a and certain configuration of your gravitational field described by a metric, thanks to a diffeomorphism, you can drag that configuration across the manifold. And the fact that your 
theory is coordinate invariant. It also means that it is diffeomorphism invariant by the observation made uh, here in the first point. And therefore, it tells you that um, your theory, your physics, doesn't see over which point of the manifold you are, because physics doesn't is in your theory is incapable of making the difference between this configuration of the gravitational field at this place in the manifold and one which is DFO dragged uh, a little further away. So what it tells you is that general relativistic physics uh, cannot see over which point of M uh, you are, and therefore M actually is not spacetime. The manifold is not spacetime. Um, and this was, of course, something that puzzled Einstein when he was uh, completing general uh, GR uh, in, in 1915. Um, and but the insight, the key, the resolution uh, came from what is called the point coincidence arguments, which says the following: It says, okay, imagine imagine you have two particle, two line particle, and when they cross, suppose they cross at some point. Well. If you act with the diffeomorphism on that on, on both those world lines, right? You can what will happen is that you will move along, drag along the, the those world line, but the crossing with them. And the crossing is a physical event, right? The, the, the crossing is what's something which would be measurable, uh, would, would be um, experimentally experimentally accessible. Right? So the inside is to say that what is physical is the relative configuration of, of fields on top of the manifold, meaning everything that is DFO invariant. And it means that space-time and physics in general can only be defined uh, relationally, right? It's a relation, relational uh, degrees of freedom uh, that physics is all about. Um, there is still more, one last point to, to be understood. So just to finish that third point, is, what it means is that M, the manifold is not space-time, but space-time is decried, described by a, a diffeomorphic class of, of, of manifold. And physics is, is described by the relative field configuration, coordinatization, by the way, of, of fields with respect to one another. It's a deeply baked uh, relational viewpoint within general relativistic physics. Uh, but there is still more, uh, which has to do with what one may call background independence, which is related to something called the Kretschmann objection. The Kretschmann objection was that any theory, which such being clever enough, can be made to satisfy the general coherence principles. And therefore, it, it was Eric Kretschmann, a mathematician in 1917, uh, questioned Einstein's assertion that uh, general coherence principle was key to general relativity. Uh, the insight is to distinguish artificial from substantive general covariance, right? So the artificial general covariance, the one that can be enforced by hand with clever tricks onto a theory, often simply hides background structure, non-relational and non-dynamical structure. For example, Minkowski metric, you could write special relativity in a generally coordinate invariant way. But what you would do is simply hide the fact that there is an object that is defined non-relationally and which has no dynamics, which is the Minkowski metric. Right? And so if you looked, for example, at the, so the diffeomorphism in, uh, symmetry that you seem to have in such a rewritten special relativity theory uh, would be artificial. And if you looked at that background structure and looked at the class of diffeomorphism or subgroup of diffeomorphism that uh, leave invariant that background structure, you would end up with Poincaré, uh, the Poincaré group, of course, which is the true symmetry group, isometric group of uh, special relativity. So you would see that most of your DFO symmetry is totally spurious, and that only the Poincaré subgroup is meaningful because it uh, leaves invariant the non relational, non dynamical structure of the theory. Substantive general covariance, on the other hand, signals that there is no non-relational and non-dynamical structure in the theory. Right? That, that's the key insight that often we understand, we should understand by background independence. So to conclude that slide, general relativistic principle, which is an epistemic uh, notion, uh, leads to understanding of the fact that there is a general relationistic physics, which is an ont ontological uh, statement about uh, physics, about reality. And in return, this ontological statement makes sense of the uh, epistemic uh, principle that we use to find uh, the fact.
And so in the in the light of this fact, we, we, we might suggest to rename general relativity as general relationality, right? Uh, an idea by Dr. Lucreza Ravera uh, that was suggested to me this, this, this summer. Um, so here is for general relativity. Now, general relativity, when it was developed, was a key point in history because it led to two different strands of historical development. The first, of course, in physics, um, led to the gradual development of gauge field theory. So to give you a couple of points to, to, to uh, along that, that history, so in 19, um, 1918, 1918, Weil proposed a unified theory of gravitation and electromagnetism, the only two known uh, interaction at the time. Uh, trying to generalize Riemann's geometry to what he called infinitesimal, truly infinitesimal geometry. And this is when he introduced the notion of gauge uh, or rescaling symmetry that nobody would call uh, conformal symmetry. So at the time, the, th the theory did not fare very well, but it, the concept of gauge was resurrected and made, made sense within the, the newly discovered context of quantum mechanics. So Weil, again, in 1929, introduce what is now known as the gauge principle for the abelian group of a phase uh, modification of the wave function in U1 in quantum mechanics to explain electromagnetism. Uh, and he also used uh, Einstein, Virbein, and local Lorentz uh, symmetry to couple gravity to fermion, right? In, in the mid 20s, spin has been discovered. So we discovered that matter, is, uh, matter, f matter is actually fermions and, uh, and Dirac, uh, in 1928, proposed his, his equation describing the electron as a, as a spin of field. And so, and then we understood from that point that to couple fermion to gravity, we need um, something called the Virbein and a, a notion of local Lorentz symmetry. In 54, pivotal moment, Young and Mills and Shaw, a student of Salam, produced the first non abelian gauge theory, right? U1 is an abelian group. Uh, the first non-abelian gauge theory was for the SU2 group, so the most obvious uh, generalization. Uh, and it was an attempt to describe the strong interaction between proton and neutron. Uh, around the same time, and absolutely independently, a Japanese physicist called Ryo Uchiyama developed uh, on its own the, the full formalism, the full framework of gauge theory for any Lie group, not only SU2 or U1, but any Lie group G. Um, and he showed in particular that GR, general relativity, is a gauge theory for the local Lorentz group. Right? So it's, it was the first time that uh, general relativity was, was explicitly um, rewritten, recast as a gauge theory. Of course, in the 60s and 70s, we gradually built up the standard model of particle physics through the use of uh, the, the spontaneous symmetry. The breaking mechanism um, in 64, used by uh, Weinberg in his, his uh, uh, 67 theory of electroweak interaction. Around the same time, the notion of quark and QCD theory was, was in, full, in full development. So that uh, by the end, uh, by, by the mid 70s, we had a reasonably well developed standard model of the three uh, non gravitational interaction, electromagnetic, weak, and strong, uh, as a gauge field theory of with gauge group U1 cross SU2 cross uh, SU3. Right? So U1 for electromagnetism, SU2 for weak, SU3 for QCD and uh, the strong interaction. In mathematics, second strand, the, we had the steady elaboration, again, starting from GR, of the differential geometry of fiber bond. So I'm guessing that most, maybe people, most of you maybe don't know exactly what, what this is about. So I, I will again give a few um, example. So in 1916, 17, for the first time, there is a, the, the development of the theory of connection on manifold, right? The, the, the tensorial calculus of Ricci and Levici Villa that's, that Einstein used to develop the general relativity uh, did not yet have a, a well-developed notion of a connection, right? the affine connection. Um, uh, we had the Christopher symbol, of course, but the, the, the conceptual notion of what is a connection in parallel transport was not yet properly developed. And this was done, uh, started to be done in a very mathematically rigorous way, only after general relativity, again, inspired mathematicians to go back to those ideas and uh, to further develop them. We've already mentioned Weil's infinitesimal geometry, um, which is essentially uh, fall within the, that current mathematical current of idea. 
um, very important actor, Cartan, Elie Cartan, the French mathematician, who has developed the notion of espace généralisé, which is a, a vast synthesis of pseudo-Riemannian geometry and Klein geometry. So Klein geometry was a uh, based on what is called the Erlangen program in the 1870s. It was an attempt to study homogeneous geometries as um, through their uh, Lie group of uh, isometries. Right. Um, so it is quite different from Riemannian geometry, which deals with uh, spaces with arbitrary curvature, so non-homogeneous spaces. Well, Cartan's uh, geometry was a synthesis of both. It, 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 uh, it synthesized and, and generalized both, both approaches to differential geometry. In the 30s, we have the first definition of the notion of fiber space or fiber bundle. Whose, those are spaces whose, whose points have, have internal structures. I will show example of that. I will explain a bit more of this and just for now, just giving you a bit of the history. In the 60, uh, sorry, 50s and 60s, we have now a mature theory of connection on fiber bundles associated with the name of Charles Rechman, who again, French mathematician, élève uh, student, sorry, of uh, Elie Cartan, uh, people like Steinrod, Kobayashi, Japanese mathematician, very well known. And, uh, <clears throat> and in the 70s, Finally, uh, some theoretical physicists and some mathematicians, some differential geometers, uh, meet and discover that the geometry of connections on fiber bundles is exactly the foundation of classical gauge field theory. Basically, both communities, physicists and mathematicians, um, have been talking about the, basically the same object through different languages. Um, so let me, for those who don't know, go back to explain what is the gauge principle, right? So the gauge principle hack works as follow. One starts with a theory of free fermions, right? free particle, which is symmetric under the action of some Lie group, G. Uh, what I mean by that is the following. The, the kinematics is given by fields that are subject to some global gauge transformation, meaning that we have a group, G, that can act as written here on those fields uh, on the left. Uh, we, and those fields are called representation of G, right? A representation mathematically is a space on which uh, a group uh, can act. We, we say that such space is a representation space for the action of the group. Think, for example, of the, the, the wave function of quantum mechanics and G as U1, the phase shift, phase uh, modification group, U1. But it can be more general, right? If you have a C2 uh, scalar field, C2 field, psi, G can be issue two, two by two complex matrices and so forth. Um, the dynamics is given by a G invariant Lagrangian. So it could be a, a Dirac type Lagrangian, right? And we take care of the fact that, okay, the, such, a, such a Lagrangian is G invariant. And we extract a Dirac equation for such a, for such a theory. But the theory describes indeed fermions propagating freely, not interacting with one another. The second step is to ask that in the spirit of local field theory, we G is made local, meaning that we don't want a, that, that a single group element acts uh, the same throughout space and time. We ask that this action is local in the sense that now G becomes gamma, a function of space time. So it's, a, it's a function that to any point x of space term associate an element of, of the group G. And so the, the, the group, the infinite dimension, dimensional group of such maps, we call uh, curly G like this. Now, of course, it is completely okay to, to have such a function, such function act on the matter field like this. But the point is that it is not, the issue is that it is not a symmetry anymore of the free Lagrangian. Right. You can you can try this. Why? Because when the derivative here acts on the transform field, it will see now the gamma, which is a function, and so will derive the gamma and not pass through it uh, uh, as, as you would have done through the constant element G there. And so you will have a, a, a new term in, in the Lagrangian when you replace psi by psi gamma. So to make G the local symmetry, the local group symmetry, we do two things. First, we introduce a gauge potential. So, so it is a four vector, a space-time vector, which will be defined 
by its gauge transformation. It is a requirement, right? We, we ask that these objects that we introduce, these four vector, transform under the local group in such a way. There. Uh, it takes value in this object into the Lie algebra of the group, right? This is the basically the first term that you see here, the, the homogeneous transformation piece uh, is the adjoint representation of the group on its Lie algebra, simply. We ask that this object is minimally coupled to the fermion via uh, a simple shift of the of the derivative. We replace the normal partial derivative by what is now known as the covariant derivative, which is simply adding to to the partial derivative this uh, the action the multiplicative action of that uh, four vector. Doing so, we will ensure that, and you can I guess we have all done this com little computation in. in for those who have taken a class in, in, in electromagnetism, um, that indeed, given those transformations, so that one for the for the fermion, that one star, the star equation for the potential, and applying the, the local transformation to uh, cover the covariant derivative of psi, we indeed verify that the covariant derivative of psi transform like the um, the psi itself, right? So. It, it, the covariant derivative preserve the uh, covariance of the fermions under the symmetry, hence the name covariant derivative. Thus, we obtain a couple theory of fermions, right, interacting with the background gauge potential. It is written in such a way. So, as we've said, we just shift shifted the partial derivative into a covariant derivative. So, what we obtain in the Lagrangian, in the Dirac Lagrangian, right, we've gone from that one, the free one to the couple one. And when you unfold what is D, we simply have the free Lagrangian we started with, plus an interaction piece, right? We see that the, the, the fermions interact with the four potential in, with, through that little piece. Yeah. But this is still a background field, right? It has no, uh, it has no dynamics on its own. For, for to, to in, um, imbue A with a dynamic, we need to add a G invariant kinematical term, kinematic term for in the Lagrangian. And we need this kinematic term to, to, need to, to be G invariant. So otherwise we have worked for, for nothing. So the way to do it is to define the so-called field strength of the four potential, which is defined by the following equation. So you see that this formula regeneralizes the Maxwell uh, Faraday tensor, right? If you neglect the bracket that is here, which is a bracket in the Lie algebra, of the group again. So in the case of U1 and Abelian algebra, these little piece here doesn't exist. And we see that this is indeed the Maxwell Faraday uh, tensor. But in non-Abelian groups, we have such a bracket that will be responsible for uh, self-coupling of the, of the gauge potential. The field strength has the good quality that it is a tensor in the, uh, the local symmetry, meaning that it transforms in the adjoint representation without any module species, which make it e a good candidate to, to build a kinematical term. Right, then we have the following uh, final theory. So we have our Dirac Lagrangian here with a, a minimal coupling term. And we have what is now called the young means uh, term, which gives you the dynamics of the gauge potential and so on. So this is by construction uh, gauge invariant, right? These are called gauge transformation, the, the, the G, the local symmetry is a really gauge transformation. And this is by construction total invariant. And uh, this is the basis, this simple uh, approach is the basis of the standard model of particle physics, right? The whole standard model is essentially built from uh, this elementary building block of theoretical construction. Um, our question is, how to explain the heuristic power of the gauge principle? Because we know that the standard model is very efficient. It's a very accurate theory of, of, of nature. And it is it has been built in part, of course, with a lot of empirical uh, inputs, and that's obvious. But it has been built in large part through the, the use of those uh, symmetry uh, principle and the gauge principle. So how to explain the, the heuristic power of the gauge principle? And also, which is connected, how to understand the ontological meaning of gauge symmetries. Say otherwise, what are gauge symmetries? Symmetries of, of what exactly, right? We, in general relativity, we know what coordinate transformation are. We know that diffeomorphism are, they are transformation of a f what we came to understand as the physical space-time, right? Um, 
or a way to encode the, the, the properties of the physical space time. But for gauge symmetries, this is not so clear. And in the in the even to in today's professional physical literature, it is not so clear um, for people. Some say it is a formal redundancy of the formalism, but on the other on the other hand, we are told that when it spontaneously breaks, like in the Higgs mechanism, it produces physical effects, like giving mass to 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 gauge uh, bosons. So there is a tension, a conceptual tension there that is not left unresolved for a long, long time. Well, my uh, argument is that there is one step in the direction of understanding gauge symmetries uh, is to understand the geometry behind gauge uh, theories. So this is the geometry of fiber bundles. So let me tell you a word uh, about fiber bundles without being too much technical, but just to give you a feeling. Uh, yeah, there is a question, please. Yes, so uh, just going back to your previous point, um, so it's yeah. true that in classical physics, you can view them either symmetries or redundancies, but mm -hmm. by the time you try to quantize theory, it's absolutely necessary to think about them as redundancies because, uh, you know, you do that, let's say, path integral uh, formulation, and mm -hmm. you have to cancel those uh, volumes of the gauge groups. And if they're symmetries, you wouldn't even think about doing that way. Uh, so I think it, as far as classics is concerned, you hear absolutely right. You could think about them redundancy or symmetry, but in quantum uh, mechanics, you must think of them as redundancies. Otherwise you just get inconsistent results. Yeah, no, but it depends what you mean by redundancies, because in a sense, you would say the same in gravity. You say, well, DFO morphism are redundancies too, because you have to, you would, if you, if you do, for example, the path integration of the- Yes, absolutely. Even no, that's absolutely model, I, I, yeah. absolutely on the same footing as, uh, as uh, DFO morphism. That, that I completely agree with. I guess uh, my only point was that classically, you can think of uh, both um, the DFO morphisms and uh, these symmetries in the same way, redundancy or not, but in quantum mm -hmm. mechanics, you absolutely have to do it as a redundancy. Yeah, no, sure. My, my, the idea is what you mean exactly by redundancy. That that's my key point. Ah. It, you 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 don't have you don't have you don't have really good insight as to what is the what how can I say this? What is the physics that is encoded into gauge symmetries? What do they mean? How come? That's the question at the bottom of the slide. How how to explain that we need or use gauge symmetries? How how to explain their efficiencies? And oh, okay. okay. So, so you say there's still redundancies. You just want to understand, um, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or let's say, le without using the term redundancies, really, the, the point is that okay, those are clearly symmetries of the formalism. The question is, what do they mean, in a sense? Like, like okay, I will give you a little uh, Ukrainia before uh, later on about general okay, okay, relativity. That's fine. That yeah, may that's maybe fine. will will uh, perhaps help uh, clarify what I'm putting with that. Yes, okay, thank another you. question. Thank Thank, thank you. you. For the question. Can we not say the redundancy is like the different solutions, different physically distinct solutions? Uh, no, because uh, sorry, can you repeat the question to be sure that I understand you properly? I thought, I thought we were discussing about redundancies. So redundancies cannot be can cannot be thought like that. We have same physical description in the solutions, and the equivalent physical descriptions are like can be thought of as re redundant redundancy in our theory and we want to mod out those equivalent descriptions from our theory can we can it, is it not like that yeah it is it is like that like, again like in gr you could say okay i can solve a strange equation and for example to get for some distribution of matter for example getting charge and solution and i could have another solution which is diffeomorphic equivalence right so diffeomorphism become a kind of a Indeed, a redundancy in the, in the formalism, because I would not get get an really another solution. I would simply, well, formally yes, I will have another solution, but the same physical situation. So the the point is that there is indeed a kind of redundancy in the sense that physics there is a there is not there is a many to one mapping between solution of the theory and physical situation, physical states. So in a sense, the, the symmetries, the gauge symmetries in particular. Describe redundancies. The question is, what does it mean, and why? And why? Why are why are those symmetries so useful to describe in fundamental physics? So we've seen in the case of GR, for example, that the symmetry coordinate invariance led to understanding that uh, we are dealing with the intrinsic geometry of a manifold, and then DFO invariance uh, encode the fact that physics is relational. 
right? And that space-time is described by the um, relational um, configuration of fields. So we have a kind of a better understanding of, of the, the meaning of the symmetries, the redundancy that exists in GR, basically. And the point is that in gauge theory, by, by and large, this question has, left, has been left unaddressed. We, have, we don't have such a comparable good understanding of what those gauge symmetries are, are about, what kind of physics they encode really. We treat them as redundancies, as inconvenience that should be either mowed out in some way. So we want to gauge fix them, we want to, to remove them from the past integral, we want to, or sometimes we can take advantage of them by choosing gauge, a gauge and another gauge. But we use it as a technicality of the formalism. We, by and large, physics physicists have not been really interested in understanding deeply what, what they mean ontologically and why they are so e efficient in building um, correct, by and large correct, uh, theories of the three fundamental interaction. So that's kind of a puzzle that I'm interested in. And so what I'm proposing is, uh, so thank you for the question. And what I'm proposing is that perhaps one step, one modest step into trying, into starting to understand the meaning of those symmetries is to better understand the geometry underlying the classical theory. Indeed, the quantum theory, I will say a word about this at the very end of the talk, but the, because the quantization is a whole honest, whole, whole mess by itself. But the, just focusing on the classical field theory, classical gauge theory, we have a very nice geometry underlying all this that should give us some insight as to what are gauge and why they are there and what they mean also. So if you allow, I will uh, now say a word quickly about the bundle geometry, which is the geometry underlying classical gauge field theory. So a fiber bundle it is, is a space whose points have an internal structure, right? So at any point of a fiber bundle, there exists a copy of a homogeneous space, which we call the fiber over that point. So here is the picturally how it goes. So M is the manifold that we customarily think of as the, the space-time manifold or encoding space-time uh, geometry. And to each point, for example, X there, we have an internal uh, internal structure for, in that point. And motion in that internal space is achieved by action of a Lie group, which is called the structure group of the bundle. Now, we need to move around in that bundle to, to move vertically around the fiber internally we, easy. We do that by the group. But if you want to move, um, let's say horizontally within the bundle, move around, we need uh, something called a connection, right? Which is a prescription to match distant fibers and, and define a notion of parallel transport in the bundle, right? So uh, it is, it is an, technically it is a one form, uh, an object with value the Lie algebra of the structure group. And what it does, uh, is the following. So picturally again, it, it tells you how to match the fiber to parallel transport point into one fiber into a point, a matching point into another fiber, an adjacent fiber. The curvature of such a connection is defined uh, as shown here um, via what is called Cartan structure equation. And it measures the fiber-wise uh, internal motion after we've done a loop in uh, the base manifold M, right? So again, pictorially, it looks like something like this. Uh, when you do a loop on uh, what is usually seen as space-time, you do an helix, generally, you will do an helix um, in the internal space. You will not end up at the point you started with. Um, we have also G equivariant functions, Psi, so what are those special functions, special objects living on the bundle? Well, those are functions with value in the representation of the structure group whose um, vertical behavior, internal behavior, is prescribed. Right? They, they, it cannot vary uh, arbitrarily along the fiber motion. It varies in that way. Right? So the value at the point PG here is uh, obtained from the value at P through the action of the group element G there. So again, it should. Of course, given what we've seen just before with the gauge uh, principle should um, raise uh, some alarm. We have a notion of covariant derivative on the, on the fiber bundle, uh, which is the sum of the Durham derivative or exterior derivative on the, on the manifold uh, there. 
uh, plus the connection. Right? And it ensures that uh, the deep side will remain a good equivalent function. Right? So in a sense, the first piece informs you about the horizontal variation of the field, while the omega psi piece informs you about the vertical motion of uh, or, or variation of, of psi. Now, we have a natural uh, symmetry group, symm transformation group, sorry, acting on that uh, space, the gauge group. So the gauge group uh, is defined as the set of maps from the fiber bundle to the structure group. And it is exactly isomorphic to what is called the vertical automorphism of that bundle. And those vertical automorphisms are nothing but diffeomorphism of that uh, enriched uh, fiber space. Uh, that preserve the vibration structure, that respect the vibration structure, right? So it differs that will not break apart the fiber. So vertical automorphisms map fibers to fibers. Oh, sorry, automorphisms will map fibers to fibers, and vertical automorphisms will only move vertically, right? And induce the, the identity transformation on the uh, base manifold M, hence the name vertical automorphism. Right? And so this group is isomorphic to what is called as the gauge group. And we can define gauge transformation of the various objects we've introduced. So the, the, the psi, the, the, the function, the omega, little omega, the, the connection, uh, big omega, the, the, the curvature. We define the gauge transformation of those objects as simply the pullback uh, by the vertical automorphism, right? In the same way that uh, diffeomorphism of M would act on tensors of M by pullback, Right, we have the vertical automorphism as diffeomorphisms acting by pullback on the various object living on that fiber bundle, and uh, the result can be expressed in terms of elements, the corresponding element of the gauge group. So, right, so we have here the, for example, the gauge transformation of the connection, which is given by this formula, which is presumably familiar for, to most of you, that we define as being the okay. The, connection transform, and the same with the curvature that will transform tensorily, the same with the gauge transformation of the equivalent function that will transform that way, and for the covalent derivative. So we see that the covalent derivative ensures, again, the G covariance, the gauge group covariance of uh, Psi. So those are the, the gauge transformation from a geometrical point of view, called active uh, transformation, right? They are vertical automorphisms of this geometrical object that is the fiber space, the fiber space. Now, um, a fiber bundle, a fiber space, has a local structure, which is locally trivial, meaning that if you look at an open set on the base manifold, M, you can choose a bundle coordinate chart uh, that will map uh, so a cylinder of the bundle into the product, the product uh, set. So it will associate to any point P in the cylinder. It's uh, the, the, the point over which uh, the fiber is attached and some element G, uh, the fiber coordinates uh, of that point P. This is called, this is done via what is called a trivialization, a trivializing section, right? So it is a little map that goes from this open set to uh, the bundle. And uh, we can change bundle charts by a change of section, right? So for example, here I've shown if you took an element G, a global element G of the, of the structure group, you, you, you shift the section by a constant amount throughout the, um, the open set. But of course, more generally, what will happen is that you can change of section altogether with an element of the gauge group. Uh, sorry, an element of what is called the transition function. Uh, of the bundle, right? So you can go from that uh, section to that other one, and you see that from one point to the next, we shift by a different amount there, right? And this is done by a function I call G, little g, from the open sets to the, the structure group that is called a transition function. And <clears throat> given a choice of section of bundle coordinates, one obtains the local representatives on the base manifold of the global object that live uh, on the fiber bundle, right? So you, you have object here, psi, omega, and the curvature, right, of, of uh, the connection of, of omega, they live on that bundle. Whenever I choose the local section, I can pull back those objects and look at them on you, 
on the base manifold, right? Through the use of that section. And what we get is therefore by definition, what the pullback of the connection is called A. Of course, you see me coming, it will be the young mills gauge potential. The pullback of the curvature will be the young mills field strength. The pullback of the current function will obviously give you a amount of field, while the pullback of the current derivative on the fiber bundle will give you the minimal coupling of the matter field with the, the young mills potential. Under change, um, sorry, yes. Now I can do the same for the uh, actively gauge transform object, right? I can pull back the gauge transform connection, which was another connection, and I will obtain this formula. I can pull back the gauge transform connection, obtaining the local representative um, in, in those terms, right? Same for the curvature and its current derivative. Right? And those, of course, looks like uh, the, the local version looks like their global counterpart, right? No surprise. But what is interesting is that under a change of bundle coordinates, the local representatives change too. Right? If I if I now pull back my global object not through sigma but through sigma prime, so that other section, what I will get is that I will obtain the new local representative in terms of the old local representative and the transition function g. Right. This is standard result of bundle geometry. And so those are called three, the, the set of equation level three here, are called passive gauge transformation or gluings. They are the exact analog of the coordinate changes in general relativity, in Riemannian geometry, right? It is a change of bundle coordinates or bundle atlas, right? Notice that they looks exactly like the set of equation level two here, but they are conceptually very different because three are just two different coordinatization, if you like, of the same global object, right? It's still omega there, for example. Omega here, and omega here. This is the same omega through seen through different local section, different coordinatizations, through different shapes of gauge, if you like. But we are still talking about the same global object. While in the set of equation level two, what we have is through the same local section, looking at two different global objects one omega, for example, and the gauge transform omega, right? So those are the local representative of um, actively transformed global objects. While well, this is just the same object looks through different local section. And this will be relevant for, for our understanding of what the gauge principle means later on. You see, perhaps you see coming the fact that this will be the analog of coordinate changes, and this will be the analog of differential invariance. And as we've seen in the case of GR, um, the two kind of symmetries have two different meanings. So the dictionary between mathematics and physics is the following, uh, that the connection here is a gauge potential, the curvature is the field strength, and the current function is a matter field, the covalent derivative is a minimal coupling, and the vertical automorphism uh, are the active gauge transformation, while the gluings are the passive gauge transformation. Now, as I was just saying, the question is, should we take seriously the ontology suggested by the geometry of the fiber bundle, right? Because we could say now, okay, we have a nice geometrical picture underlying classical gauge field theory. We have a natural geometrical space, the fiber bundle, that seems to indicate that the natural geometrical arena for classical gauge field theory is that of an enriched space-time whose points have an internal structure, a rich internal structure, group theoretic in nature. And we have and we now understand gauge symmetries as arising from the natural intrinsic geometry of such an internal space. Right? They are not artificial and gratuitous redundancy of algebraic nature of a formalism. They, are, they, they come from a very natural geometric structure in the same way that coordinate transformation and DFO morphism arise as natural um, transformation um, uh, of the geometric structure that was remaining manifold or pseudo remaining manifold. So um, let, let me propose a kind of Uchronia to, to, to try to push around our intuition on that point. Uh, you could have an, a kind of an Uchronia about the discovery of GR, right? So uh, suppose that we discover special relativity, as usual, based on the global Lorentz group, SO13, by Einstein still. The spin is discovered by the same people around the mid-20s. And then using Catton spinner representation, 
discovered in the 1913. Um, Dirac still described uh, his equation, the residual for spinners, via the SO113 invariant theory, right? because it is still uh, um, globally SO13 SO13 uh, invariant in the in this way, right? Uh, when the action this time the action on, on the spinner is not only the phase shift, but the Lorentz, the global Lorentz transformation, right? Now, applying the gauge principle, we could say, well, let's make local, Lorentz uh, local, right? Having not a, a global Lorentz transformation, but a local one. And uh, of course, we need for these some technicalities. We introduce local frames and uh, stuff like that. And we ask that, uh, therefore, in the spirit of the gauge principle, we introduce a, a, a gauge potential within the Lie algebra of the Lorentz group that, by definition, should transform in such an homogeneous way. And we have a skill strength built in the same model as before, transforming tensorially, and we minimally couple it via the covariant derivative, as we do in the in the um, gauge principle, and then we build a local Lorentz invariant gauge theory of fermions coupled to a self-interacting gauge field, which is that one, uh, this omega mu here. And uh, we discover uh, that this is an empirically adequate local relativistic theory of gravity, actually generality with torsion. Um, a remark is that such a, a reconstruction, field theoretic reconstruction of GR, without much geometry was proposed indeed by Weil first, uh, in some sense, almost, uh, by UTMA for sure in 55, and also by Weinberg from a more quantum theory, quantum field theory point of view, and also by Feynman, uh, seeing it as a, as a quantum field of a, of a spin to field, at least uh, at the linear level. And uh, let, let's suppose in our Cronia last step that in the 30s, mathematicians like Levi Civita, Carton, signals that the theory is actually written in the language of the differential geometry of a uh, pseudo Riemannian uh, manifold or espace generalisé, uh, Carton's espace generalisé, uh, so to speak. I think given the empirical success of such a theory, we would be naturally compelled to accept the ontology of a curved space time as the explaining uh, gravity. Right, we would accept that the, the the ontology suggested by the geometrical framework that we have. So, I would propose again uh, just a proposal, but I, I submit to your consideration the proposition that the logic that said that the empirical success of GR uh, weighs in favor of some ontological commitments toward the geometric framework, which in, in turn explain the heuristic success of the coherence uh, general coherence principle as the epistemic counterpart of the ontological properties of the, of the, of the physical uh, space-time. Well, this logic applies, mutatis mutandis, to um, gauge theories, so that the empirical success for gauge field theory, in the form of the standard model, weighs in favor of some degree of ontological commitment to the geometric framework um, underlying it, uh, which in turn would explain the heuristic success of the gauge principle as the epistemic counterpart of the ontological properties of uh, an enriched space-time, which is the fiber bundle. Um, of course, there is a natural objection, which would be, well, maybe, but the best empirical support for the standard model um, came from its quantum nature, right? It's a quantum gauge field theory. Yes, please, question? Um, yes, I would like to, to ask a question about this that has to do with sure. the, 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 the analogy with general relativity. The mm -hmm. whole idea of the whole uh, objection or the whole argument uh, mm -hmm. was this idea that uh, you have a, some kind of manifold on which you place degrees of freedom. And once you figure out the relational, uh, the relations between neighboring degrees of freedom, you can sort of remove the manifold. So the manifold itself is not physical. It's just this, the relational structures between the field degrees of freedom. Yes. Very good. The question is, what is the analog for gauge field theories? Do you remove the fiber bundle? Uh, that's a very good, excellent question. And indeed, I think that there is exactly the same structure that indeed is at play. Yes, I, I will touch, I think I will say well on this very shortly. Okay, I think. okay, thank you. Very good, question. but my, my, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so yeah, my take is indeed that um, in the very same, Okay, let me see if I indeed say what I want to say now, and otherwise, just I will. Oh, 
All right, um, thanks. If I've never responded to that question, uh, but I think I, I'm coming to it, very good question. So um, yeah, so just to, to finish on that little objection, um, it is true that the standard model is especially successful uh, as a quantum gauge free theory, right? So while the geometry, as we as I advertised, pertain mainly to the classical gauge free theory, uh, this is true, uh, but mainly for the non-Abelian sector of the standard model, the weak and the strong interaction, because we have an Abelian sector that has a well-supported uh, infrared limit, classical limit, which is Maxwell theory. So if anything. The, the empirical success of relative empirical success of Maxwell theory uh, would speak in favor of at least, so to speak, seeing um, space time as enriched with a U1 internal structure. Right? If really you want to withhold um, judgment or opinion regarding the non abelian sector, at least the argument retains some force uh, regarding the classical um, abelian limit. Uh, also, GR presumably is the infrared limit uh, of some quantum theory of gravity, and yet we do not withhold, generally, we do not withhold the ontological commitment to its geometrical structure, right? We have no problem saying, okay, well, sure, at least at the classical, in the classical limit of some more fundamental quantum theory, there is something like um, geometrical space-time that emerged that is indeed described by some geometric, uh, by the geometry of, of, of pseudo Riemann. Uh, uh, the geometry. So my point, my argument would be that either you suspend ontological commitment to the geometry of both the standard model and GR, or you apply the same uh, process to assess their the respective ontology. Right? You have to be. My, my, my claim is that we have to be consistent in in, in um, uh, agreeing or withholding uh, or, or, or ontological commitment. So. Uh, the conclusion, uh, which is of course provisional, is that I would argue that gauge field theory suggests an enriched space time with point of internal structure. Um, that gauge fields, so the gauge potential and matter fields, probe this geometry. Uh, in particular, we have that the matter field moves freely within that geometry uh, as prescribed by the connection, uh, the gauge potential. Right. In a sense, the, 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 the Dirac equation um, or the minimal coupling is uh, the exact analog of a geodesic equation in the fiber bundle formalism. Uh, the gauge principle, first version, uh, asks for invariance under passive gauge transformation. I, I think this is where I answer the question uh, just uh, asked. Um, so the gauge principle, the first version, uh, argue that we should build theories that are invariant under passive gauge transformation. Right, bundle coordinate covariance, I would say, uh, which moon means again understood the geometry origin of the of, of the principle, underlying the principle that physics sees only the intrinsic geometry of the bundle, right? In the same way that uh, the general covariance principle uh, meant that physics, generalistic physics, sees only the intrinsic geometry of M, right? Um, so that would be the immediate interpretation of the gauge principle, that physics is only the intrinsic geometry of the bundle. It doesn't care about which choice of local section, which kind of gauge you choose to describe it. So it is indeed a, a statement of epistemic democracy. All observers have equal access to the world, meaning the enriched space-time, the bundle. Um, the, and the property of the enriched space-time, so again, ontological statement, grounds the epistemic, um, if, the heuristic power of the epistemic gauge principle. Uh, but now we have, um, as you have observed, the passive gauge transformation are locally indistinguishable from active gauge transformation. So the moment we ask, we ask for our theory of physics to be uh, invariant under bundle coordinate change, uh, we have uh, asked that it is invariant under the vertical automorphism of the bundle. So inver and inverse under the active uh, gauge transformation, vertical uh, automorphism, carry a very different meaning. And indeed, I, agree, I, I, I would I would say that uh, there is a whole art, whole type argument that can be made um, based on this, which means that uh, the physics, so I would call that an internal whole argument, that would say that the physics doesn't see points of the fiber, of the internal uh, space. Um, so the bundle isn't the space-time, the enriched space-time. But the, uh, I, I can use an internal point coincidence argument that says that physics is only the relative internal field configuration, right? Meaning all uh, automorphism, vertical automorphism invariant quantities, exactly like in GR. 
right? So there is indeed a kind of disappearance of the bundle. If you, it's, I would not quite state it exactly like that. Uh, I would say that the, the manifold, like the bundle now, uh, are kind of meta coordinate in a sense. They are there to bootstrap your ability to describe physics, but then you realize that, oh, like coordinates, are actually, I don't need really the coordinates. I, I'm dealing with a whole class of coordinates. Well, actually, I'm dealing with a whole class of manifold or whole class of other bundles. So the internal structure of space-time and of gauge fields can only be defined relational. That would be the final conclusion uh, that I would uh, draw from the, the gauge principle. Uh, not to conclude the conclusion, <laughs> I would simply say that uh, from the geometrical perspective, the, the, the general covariance principle and the gauge principle, viewed in a passive way, combine into the diffeomorphism and vertical endomorphism uh, group, uh, which together uh, are mixed in a non-trivial way into what is called the bundle automorphism of the uh, the group of bundle automorphisms, and uh, there is what is called a, okay this is a technicality but it's called a short exact sequence right um, so the, this is a normal subgroup of the automorphism group and the automorphism group projects into the automorphism of of the base manifold aka space time. Um, so th there is a the, the, there is a unified geometric framework that put both principle, both key principles of physics together. Um, so we have a relativistic gauge physics encoded relationally into uh, automorphism class of bundle. This is what I would uh, suggest. Um, to push a little further, and I think I will conclude there because I'm already probably over time now. Uh, there is what is called a generalized question and objection that says that beware, any theory can be made to have a gauge symmetry. If you are, use uh, good enough tricks, the stricker butt trick, for example, is one. Um, and so these uh, generalized question and objection, which is therefore a kind of question and objection applied to the gauge principle rather than to the general covariance principle, uh, push the distinction between artificial and substantive gauge symmetries, right? So we have a, a notion of, um, uh, so the distinction between the two rely on the existence or not of a trade-off between uh, gauge invariance and locality, right? So for example, uh, if you have a, a theory whose gauge symmetry can be removed without costing the locality of the theory, we have you have uh, an artificial gauge symmetry. The, the symmetry doesn't encode any relevant physics at all. Uh, whereas uh, the substantive gauge symmetries are those that when you try to remove them, you end up invariably uh, with a non-local theory, right? So in a sense, the the, 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 the key physical signature of a substantive gauge symmetry is, is a gauge non-locality, something like what is appearing in the uh, um, uh, aronov bomb effect, for example. So final question, of course, and this came back to the quantum field theory stuff, um, the question that we may ask is how does such classical geometric ontology arise from quantum field theory, right? Because if we admit that the ultimate nature of thing is to be quantum, uh, presumably the, the, the deeper ontology uh, has to do with the ontology of quantum field theory, which is okay, very, very, very difficult question. We have already a hard time dealing with quantum mechanics. So uh, assessing the, the correct ontology of quantum field theory is uh, by no means a trivial matter, but for sure, um, uh, th these ontologies should should be what gives rise to to the to the geometric ontology of of, of gauge, classical gauge field theory and therefore presumably also of, of general relativity. And so my take is that a, a proper answer to that question awaits that we find the proper mathematical foundation of QFT, which is not yet a done deal at all by any means. And um, yeah, that's a whole program ahead. And with that, I think I am done. So thank you very much for your patience and your attention. And I'm happy to take any question. Great, thank you so much for that talk. Um, so any questions in the room? Well, I, I, I have a question here. Um, when you change to Ashtekar variables, uh, mm -hmm. Would you say that the new symmetries that arise there, are they artificial or substantive? Are they... Um, maybe I can try to answer kind of uh, obliquely, because I'm not sure I fully... My, my grasp on the hash checker variable uh, mm. framework is, is good enough. But I would say that, for example, the, the judgment about 
uh, artificiality or substantiality of a symmetry, of course, ha is highly dependent on the precise model of the theory you use. For example, um, if you do scalar electro electromagnetism, electromagnetism with a scal complex scalar field, uh, then you can remove the U1 symmetry and still have a local symmetry. So U1 in that model of, of electromagnetism is totally artificial. You can do without it. Whereas if you do uh, spinoidal electromagnetism, as far as I know, uh, there is no way to remove uh, U1 without getting something non-local. You will have uh, Dirac dressing, holonomies of the connection. You just, invariably, you end up with something which is non-local. And so in that case, spinoidal electromagnetism, you have a U1 which is, uh, which is a substantive. So coming to the, your question, exactly in, in exactly the same way, if you do GR, in the sometimes it's called the, what is it the second or, uh, first order Matrix, formalism the, um, so te, yeah. yeah exactly the tetrad formalism um, if you do GR without matter or GR coupled with scalar field or dust field or fluid or whatever uh, local Lorentz is artificial because you, you can you can remove Lorentz and still have a perfectly normal metric theory lo, local metric theory so Lorentz is artificial in that case if you introduce spinorial matter field. There is no way to remove uh, Lorentz. So in that more realistic setup, wow. uh, Lorentz becomes indeed uh, substantive because it, it killing it will result in a non-local theory, as far as I know. That would Very be good. my take for now. Again, provisional take, but that would be my argument. So, so, so here is a follow-up question on the on the basic of the same thing. Why yeah. is non-locality taken to be such a crucial or or locality rather? such a crucial criterion for substantiveness. Couldn't it just be the case that the world is not local, period? Or is it a matter of uh, convenience? Yeah. No, indeed. Well, I, I would say that I, I, I suspend judgment as to the question of if non-locality or locality is important. I'm, I'm, I'm just happy to notice that there is, a, that there is at least this, two, this distinction between two classes of symmetries. One type of gauge symmetry that can be removed without costing locality, those I decide to call them artificial, okay. just a terminological um, move. And those that cannot be removed without costing locality, I choose to call them substantive because they seem to encode to tell you something. They, they seem to say, well, okay, if, if you try to remove me, I will, you can try, but I, I will then make your half. Not, not your life, uh, again, it's not just a matter of making life easier or not. It's just that saying, it's just observing that there is this trade-off that is uh, seem to be a physical signature. Uh, to my view, it is kind of nicely, um, it, it appears nicely in the of bomb effect. The fact that there is, there is no way to interpret the of bomb effect as arising from the local interaction of gauge invariant fields. Because nor the gauge potential, nor the electron field in the theory are gauge invariant fields. They are gauge variant variables. So there, there is no field, local field theoretic account of the AB effect, which is intriguing and puzzling. Um, yeah, Thank you. so my Thank pleasure. You. Yeah. Yes, there is another question I see. Yes. Yeah, thank you much for the excellent talk. And going back you. uh, to your story about locality versus non-locality, at least for pure young mills theory, there was this very nice formulation in terms of loop variables in the 80s, where you say that instead of using the mm -hmm. fields themselves as degrees of freedom, you use Wilson lines, or Wilson loops to be precise. And yeah. that that works perfectly. Yeah. So then you never have to think about gauge redundancy and so on. Uh, the only problem with this uh, is theory is immensely complicated. So as you pointed out, it's a trade-off. Uh, you could either introduce this local yeah. gauge degrees of freedom, or you have this very complicated loop equations. They're all written down, nobody can solve them, but mm -hmm. uh, the equations can be formulated that way. So what right. I'm wondering is uh, when you say what, what is real and what is not real, is it really about uh, local versus non-local or more generally about easy description versus complicated description? So uh, sorry, can you, can... at least for pure young mills, we need to introduce uh, the gauge fields just because we need some nice, uh, basically simple local description. But if you give up that requirement, you don't even have to think about gauge fields. You just have to think about Wilson lines. Yes, yes, and and those Wilson lines, they are they are by definition they are non-local objects, right? That's right. They are defined through, through yeah. yeah. 
Right. So, 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 so the we, question I, is whether you say that something is real is not real. Is it just a matter of convenience, or it's more than that? No. Well, I guess I'm, I'm kind of a, of a I wouldn't say a naive realist, but I, I'm a kind of a, a default realist. I mean, what is real or not really is not a matter of, of taste, right? It, it should be something that is uh, assessed no. by, by by your. Or, sorry, please. Oh no 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 so 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 when you say that you need gauge fields, e mm -hmm. whether you don't need gauge fields, I guess it's not about reality. It's really whether you need them or you don't need them. Mm -hmm. Is it just a matter of convenience? So if you want something that's local and simple, then you would need them. If you say yeah. that you give up these requ uh, requirements, then you don't really need gauge fields. You just formulate things in terms of variables which don't even involve them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess in, in that in that case, I, I would not. It's not that you don't need them, right? Because even when you have Wilson lines, I would say that it's it's simply a, a reformulation of the same gauge fields. At least in my in the geometric understanding of things, you know, gauge fields are connection on a fiber bundle. Wilson lines or Wilson loops are holonomies of such connections. So all those notion and concept all belong to the geometry of of, of fiber bundles. So right, in a right. sense, I don't. I, no, no, that, that's why we think about that. that uh, so, so one way to think about them is indeed you have these gauge fields mm -hmm. and you build Wilson loops from them. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a more or less a standard approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm saying is that in the 80s, people asked a different question. They said, suppose Wilson loops is all you have. Yeah. We don't ask where yeah. they come from. These are the these are really the fundamental objects in your theory. Can yeah. you find theory pure for the purely for that objects? Mm -hmm. It turns mm -hmm. out that you can. Yeah, yeah. And the only issue, well, there are two issues with this. First of all, these objects are non-local. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that the equations are just too complicated. You can't really make too much progress in them. But but right, technically, right. all these equations have been written down in the 80s. So as yeah, long yeah. as you're willing to give up the uh, locality and the simplicity, mm -hmm. quote unquote, uh, mm -hmm. the um, you know, you don't you don't really need gauge fields. But yeah, of course yeah. it just makes you well, I would say um, probably I, I yeah, I understand. Probably I have two two thoughts. I don't know if I have really an answer to 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 your question, but maybe two thoughts. Uh, the first would be that um, I I don't I'm, I'm not entirely sure of that, but I think there are kind of reconstruction theorem or equivalent or category equivalence theorem between the uh, how you can reconstruct from starting from autonomy autonomy of a, of a bundle, how you can reconstruct the bundle plus connection. You know, there is those categories, those those uh, very fundamental theorem in bundle geometry. When you say, okay, when I have a bundle, a class of bundle plus connection, I can there is a, a functor to the holonomy, uh, so to speak, holonomy um, uh, language, and vice versa. I, I can I can go back and forth between the two. So the fact that there is this dictionary, this transition between the two, would say that even if you choose to say, let me take holonomies. With some loop as primary, you can always go back uh, to the to the reconstruct the geometry underlying it, and vice versa. So, from a strictly mathematical standpoint, um, I, I'm not sure you can simply the fact that there is two incarnation of of the same underlying structure. I'm not sure that it says that you can uh, dispense entirely with with one or the other or the of the duality. I would say. One, one or the other pole of the duality. Um, and and although the, other, the second thought that I have in mind is that um, I guess if you try to assess what is the ontology of a theory, you should use the formulation of the theory that is the most empirically efficient. So if you have a framework of a theory that seems to be at least formally defined, etc., but we cannot extract much in terms of empirical data uh, from it, I would say this is not the theory whose formulation has been empirically tested so to speak uh, i would say if the one that is better put to test is the one from which you extract numbers that are then tested uh, is the is the one that you should uh, that should i would say uh, on which you should focus your your interpretive uh, efforts oh, uh, no no no, no. You, you, okay so when i said you cannot extract data what i meant is you can do very little with this wilson loops analytically mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if you think about gauge field theory, uh, uh, you know um not the gauge field, uh, the uh, lattice gauge theory, where mm -hmm. people put things on the computer, they actually deal with Wilson lines. Right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. So, so strictly speaking, mean, of it's a Wilson line theory which is being solved numerically. 
It just yeah, analytically absolutely. make very little QCD, Like QCD, for example, that you That's put right. on the That's latis, right. absolutely, right. I agree. Yeah, no, no, and I it agree. deals precisely with those non-local, uh, yeah. but gauge invariant variables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I, I totally agree. Yeah, no, indeed, interesting. And by the way, again, probably you should be stressed out that we are talking about the quantum version of the theory there. Right, which, right, which which is indeed a whole whole other um, yeah a whole, whole other because most of my talk as you've seen have been focused on the classical uh, gauge field theory uh -huh. version, but yes indeed when you are dealing with the quantum uh, version uh, then okay there is a, a whole new chapter of the discussion that should be open indeed I, I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you much yeah. for the excellent talk and thanks for thank you thank, thank you for you. attending yeah. Okay, so we have a question here. So the question, okay, yes. Yeah. So the, the question that I have um, is uh, in one of the earlier slides, you were talking about how I think people have like equal access or should have equal access to all the world's resources. And uh, that the, and de the democracies of countries are helped by uh, symmetry and things. So my question is, is like, because, um, because uh, inertial, because, oh, I'm just trying to say this here. Um, um, so because uh, when an event's being observed, uh, it can be, it's, it's based on the person's uh, frame of reference. Is that what this theory is sort of suggesting in terms of how, uh, because symmetries are broken, that that's the reason for why people don't have equal access? Because we know in in the real world that people either, well, I guess they do have equal access. It's just they're not getting those resources. Is that kind of what this theory is about, trying to um, figure out the reasons why that, why that uh should be equal access is not uh in fact happening no sorry i'm not sure i understand the the, the question um okay just, just to rephrase what i've said precisely the idea is that symmetry principle in physics are principle of democratic epistemic access to the world right it is a it says that basically no viewpoint is privileged to access the world Would it be fair to say that you use the word democratic as, as a metaphor? Yes, of course. Or the different uh, reference frames or the different... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, exactly. It doesn't really have anything to do with... Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's absolutely not a political statement of any kind, no. Exactly. <laughs> no, no, no no, sociological. No, 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 of course not. It is, it is a metaphoric... Uh, way to understand well yes yes semi-metaphoric uh, point that says simply that every observer and when i say observer this is, it has nothing to do with subjectivity either by the way it simply said that any epistemic agent meaning uh, uh, entity capable of of observing the world in a, in a, in a fair and an uh, unbiased way um will have it, equal standing to write down the laws of nature. This is what it means. And there is no privileged standpoint to write them. Does it clarify maybe my meaning? Sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so I was just asking, so um, because uh, in the world symmetries are sometimes broken, my question I'm very interested in is, is this um, explanation here sort of getting at, like, why is it that, because we know in real life that, you know, certain countries are poorer than others. So is this theory can be used to sort of explain that or why that, why that equal, even though um, everybody has access, we know it's not equal. No, no, no. Really, really, we are dealing with fundamental physics and uh, and 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 philosophy. And of physics. It has nothing. No, no. In, in that case, it has nothing to do with sociology, political uh, uh, organization, or, or you know, nothing of the sort. No, no, no. It's it's yeah. It's much more fundamental than that. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
Yeah, it, it has to do with the ontological structure of the world. Really, it, it, whatever if human didn't exist, what I'm saying here still, will still stand. It applies to any any conscious, any sentient species in the universe. Any epistemic agent in the universe would be subject to those. Great. Well, thank you very much. If there are no other questions, let's thank Jordan again. Thank you very much.